Fellow, praise the Lord. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to the online voice of Ecclesia Teaching Center. Grace and peace to you. Thank you for joining us. I'm Brother Michael. In one sense, we are continuing to look at various myths and misconceptions. And tonight, we are going to continue on with our John 316 Lectio series. Tonight's Lectio is connected to John 316 because it helps us to bring clarity to the question as to whether or not it is God's will or intention to save everyone. So we, we're gonna go into a little deep, you know, put your thinking caps on. Hopefully, you know, you prayed before you came. Um, tonight's lecture may most likely be the last in the series, but I have looked forward to teaching on this for quite some time now. I first began to piece this teaching together several years ago, and I pray it will be a blessing to you as it has been to me. You know, it puts the finishing touches to the whole question as to whether or not it is God's intention to save everyone. Or at least I trust that it will answer any lingering questions you or others you may know may still have. To me, it's very clear, and I pray that the Lord will, by his grace, minister at least some measure of clarity to you as well. So this is Lectio 5 in the John 3.16 Lectio series. If you've not done, done so as yet, I encourage you to become familiar with the train of thought line upon line as presented in the first four lectures of the series. The first four were one, John 3.16, Lecture 2, Does God Love Everyone? Lecture 3, Does All Always Mean All? Lecture 4, What Is Meant by the World? I believe that the script here upon which tonight's teaching is based may be just as controversial or a little more so than John 3.16, and I'll show you why in a minute. I'm convinced that the reason why so many stumble at John 3.16 and this other passage that we're going to quote is that their doctrine of God is faulty. This is not difficult to prove. But first of all, we, you know, first all we have to do is to be convinced that God sets out to accomplish a task. Once, once he sets out to accomplish a task, nothing can stand in his way or prevent him from achieving his purpose. By the way, believe it or not, this is the problem right here. There are people who say, no, God may set out to do something, but if man doesn't want him to do it, he can't do it. And this is where we have problems. You see, we, we disagree with that at Ecclesia. There are those who dispute this, you know, uh, the free will crowd actually believes that sinful man controls the master switch and that God can do, can do nothing unless sinful man gives the okay. They see the final decision as resting with the spiritually dead. I have a problem with that. You know, there is even a teaching making the wrongs for many years that since the fall of Adam, God has had to wait to obtain permission to re-enter the earth realm because when Adam sinned, God supposedly lost control of the earth. I hope you're hearing this because this is madness. This is all part of the... So, so you see, do you see how far reaching the John 3.16 deception goes? To put forward a God who has to ask permission to enter his earth own universe is absolute nonsense and is very close to blasphemy. We are supposed to believe that God had to ask permission to implement his own plan of salvation and give his only begotten son. But you know, here, here, is, what, here is what the Bible says in, in Job 23, 13. But he is in one mind, and who can turn him? And what his soul desireth, even that he doeth. Now, there are many, many other scriptures, but, you know, we can't choose everyone. But this one tells us God brings his plan to pass. Whatever is on his mind, 
Whatever he desires, he's going to do it. Whatever is on his mind, who can turn him from it? Whatever he desires, he is going to do it. He is going to bring it to pass. I like this other passage of scripture in Daniel 4.35. And all the inhabitants of the earth are reputed as nothing. And he do it according to his will in the army of heaven. And among the inhabitants of the earth. And none can stay his hand or say unto him, what doest thou? Hmm? Does that sound like a God who needs to ask permission? You see, does that, I mean, seriously. So you see, no one can prevent the fulfillment of God's will. So if God loves the whole world with a redemptive kind of love and really wants to save everyone in the world without exception, don't you think he has the power to do so? Of course. Again, if God wants to save everyone, who can stay his hand? Or what can prevent him from doing so? These are the searching questions we need to ask. And these questions will not be understood by focusing on sentimental statements about God being a God of love. God is also a God of justice and of wrath. There are people in hell right now because their only emphasis about God is that he is a God of love. You see, here's the thing, and we're going to go into a little bit of deep waters here. God wants the fullness, the fullness of his glory to be made manifest. Follow me, please. If God saved everyone, then his glorious attributes of justice and wrath would never be known or manifested. He would just be known as a God of love and the fullness of the knowledge of God would never be known. The knowledge of the glory of God would never cover the earth as the waters cover the sea. Let's hear from God himself as to why he decreed evil to enter the world. But, but hold on, before we do so, please keep in mind that to decree evil is not the same as to create evil as we read in Isaiah 45, 7. In Isaiah 45, 7, God says, I, me, big me, I form the light and create darkness. I make peace and create evil. I, the Lord, do all these things. You know, one, one translation says, I send good times and bad times. God may create situational evil such as calamities but he never creates nor instigates moral evil look at, look at job job understood this you know his wife said you still holding on to your integrity curse god and die but you know he said unto her thou speakest as one of the foolish women speaketh and you know sometimes you have to Men, you have to correct your wives. Um, you know, don't speak like that. That's not right. Thou speakest as one of the foolish women speaketh. What? Shall we receive good at the hand of God and shall not we receive evil? In all this did not Job sin with his lips. Notice what he calls evil. The calamities that he is experiencing. Not moral evil, but situational evil. God sent bad times upon Job for a season. Remember the point we're making. Though God decrees moral evil, he does not create moral evil. To decree is not to create. To decree is to foreordain whatsoever comes to pass. You know, Go back to lecture seven, see what it says. You know, lecture eight, see what it says, see what it says. You see, so to decree is to foreordain whatsoever comes to pass, either to allow or to permit. You see, God decreed that Adam would sin, but he did not do Adam's sinning for him. 
Adam brought sin into the world by his own disobedience through his Bible says through one man. Just so God decreed that sin would enter the world, and he also decreed that sin would be punished forever in the lake of fire. Please follow my thought. If God decreed that sin be punished forever, he also decreed that some men would be in hell forever. And if he decreed that some men be in hell forever, it means he did not decree their salvation. Please remember that God does as he pleases. So this means he chose not to save everyone because he could have easily decreed it, but no. You see, but you know, listen, in all truthfulness, at least to me, this is a very, very uncomfortable subject. Very uncomfortable. Because since nothing can overrule God's decree, it means it is not his will to save everyone. We are seeking very reverently, reverently, to find out why. If we may ask that question, because this is pretty close to Deuteronomy 29, 29, the secret things belong unto God. But maybe we can sort of catch a glimpse. See, why he decreed evil in the world and why he decreed that there shall be evil people in hell forever. That's what we're trying to find out. God, how come? See, re remember though, remember though, though God decreed moral evil. He did not create it. Moral evil springs from the bitter root of a corrupted fallen nature. Moral evil is the offspring of original sin. Moral evil originates with those who sin and fall short of the glory of God. And this includes a serpent. You see, God may decree moral evil, but he does not create it. If God created moral evil, he would fall short of his own glory. For instance, God decreed that Judas would do what he did, but God did make him do it. The moral evil of Judas sprang from his own evil nature. If God creates evil, it is as a direct result of his decree, seeing that God decrees everything that comes to pass. But remember that the evil that God creates is never of a moral nature. Some ask why God isn't saving everyone. But we cannot come to an understanding of this question until and unless we come to some understanding and consideration of the glory of God. You see how deep this goes? You can't just say, well, ah, God is love. So that's the answer right there. Wait. We cannot preoccupy ourselves with why he is not saving everyone. Like we said, God isn't saving everyone because he decreed evil would be in the earth and that this evil would be judged and punished forever. Plus, if God saved everyone, hear this, hear this, please then all that men would know of God would be his glorious attribute of love. But the fullness of his glory would not be known. It is important that we get this. No one would know of his justice and his wrath. How would his hatred of sin be known? What does the Lord say? And here is where it gets scary. You know, the, the origin of evil, Just let me quote this. We read it, we, we saw it before. Moral evil springs from the bitter root of a corrupted fallen nature. Moral evil is the offspring of original sin. Moral evil originates with those who sin and fall short of the glory of God. So let's, let's, let's take another look. See something here in Romans 9, 21 to 23. Verse 21, had not the potter power over the clay of the same lump to make one vessel unto honor and another unto dishonor? So here, 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 now here's what we're reading. 
we are reading that God makes one vessel unto honor, which means one vessel that shall be the recipient of the redemptive love of God, and another vessel unto dishonor, who shall be overlooked and bypassed, and shall not receive the benefits of the redemptive love of God, and this person will be dishonored in hell forever. Go back to the beginning of the verse. Hath not the potter power over the clay? Think about that. Listen, when I read these passages of scripture, and I have chills, look at verse 22. What if God, Paul is, Paul is reasoning with us. He's saying, what if God, willing to show his wrath and to make his power known, endured with much long suffering the vessels of wrath fitted to destruction. What does fitted to destruction mean? It means that they, 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 by their very, by, by their very, the, the way they are, their, their, their heart, you know, it's, it's, what was that phrase, you know, where, where moral evil is just penetrating the, the heart of men, sinful desires, hatred of God, you know, these are vessels of wrath fitted to destruction. All God has to do is to leave them alone to themselves. And they are vessels of wrath fitted to destruction. Look at verse 23. And that he might make known the riches of his glory on the vessels of mercy which he had afore prepared unto glory. So prepared unto glory is the opposite of being fitted for destruction. You understand? So hear this. The ultimate reason why some are not saved is not because they rejected God. You know why? We all rejected God until he quickened some of us. The ultimate reason that God is not attempting to save everyone is based on his glory. He wanted to have his wrath and power known. And if he saved everyone, there would be no manifestations of his wrath. In other words, that he might make known the riches of his glory on the vessels of mercy, the vessels of mercy, which he had afore, before time prepared unto glory. If he saved all men, then all we would know of God would be that he is love. And it is God's intention to have the fullness of his glory known. Okay? Well, you know, many object and say God has no right to save some and not save all. I'm not sure they understand what a fearful position that is. But let's let Paul answer. We're still in Romans 9, but we're going back to verse 19 and 20. Thou wilt then say unto me, why doth he yet find fault? For who hath resisted his will? In other words, if there are people fitted unto destruction, why does God blame them? You see? So Paul is saying, you will say then unto me, why doth he yet find fault? For who hath resisted his will? Nay or no, but O oh man, who are you that repliest against God? Shall the thing form say to him that formed it, why hast thou made me thus? Basically, what he is saying is, who are you to question God? Okay? Let's move on. I understand that there are passages of Scripture that are troubling to many of us, and it is to those passages that we turn right now. I can appreciate that no matter how many arguments we put forth about God not loving everyone, not including everyone in his plan of salvation, there are passages of scripture that seem to say quite the opposite. But tonight we intend to clear things up by the grace of God. Amen. So here we go. Here are the passages we are going to unpack tonight. 
Scripture 1, 2 Peter 3, 9. The Lord is not slack concerning his promise, as some men count slackness, but is long-suffering to usward, not willing that any should perish, not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. Ooh, this is exciting. First Timothy, First Timothy 2, for this is good and acceptable in the sight of God our Savior, who will have all men to be saved and to come unto the knowledge of the truth, who will have all men to be saved and to come unto the knowledge of the truth. We're going to unpack those two verse, those two passages of scripture. But first, I would like to tell you the story of us. Yeah, the story of us, uh, otherwise known as the, the concept of us. One of the things that we need to be aware of is that scripture differentiates between those who live lives without reference to God and those who live their lives under the covering of his covenantal love. In other words, though God may not have a redemptive covenant with all mankind, he does have such a covenant with us. This is the story of us. What we are seeking to do is to show that the Bible has many references to a company of people known as us. We cannot list every passage. We can only list but a few. In seeking to unpack this truth, let's begin our journey at Isaiah. Isaiah chapter 9 and verse 6. For unto us a child is born. Unto us a son is given. And the government shall be upon his shoulder. And his name shall be called Wonderful, Counselor, the Mighty God, the Everlasting Father, the Prince of Peace. Unto us a child is born. And unto us a son is given. Notice how in, in this one short phrase, Isaiah explains John 3.16. Notice. Okay. Unto us a son is given. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. But wait, wait, wait. Isaiah had clarified this before. So John is not departing from Isaiah's definition. John is not departing from Isaiah's uh, understanding. You see, when he says that for God so loved the world, we need to understand what actual, what portion of the world is he talking about? He's talking about us. Because unto us a child is born, and unto us a son is given. So you see, the child is born, and as that child grew, you see, uh, to be a son, that son is given. So you find in, in, in this short phrase, Isaiah clarifies the meaning of the word world. John says that God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. But the Isaiah passage clarifies the John passage. Isaiah reveals that the only begotten son was really given to us and not to the whole wide world. This is the story of us. The Isaiah passage is about the earthly work and ministry of the child who grew to be a son so as to bring many sons to glory. Remember, the son was given unto us to be our representative. We are the beneficiaries of his birth, life, death, burial, and resurrection. Upon completion of his redemptive work, he was exalted to the right hand of the Father, and the government is now upon his shoulder. All authority in heaven and earth is given unto him. He now receives many titles. Now, we, we, we won't go through these titles except for one. Note that his name shall be called the Everlasting Father. This, this is the confusing to some, so that's why we, ch we chose this one. This has nothing to do with the Trinity. He shall be called the Everlasting Father. Th this has nothing to do with the Trinity. What it refers to is the reward for his person and work on behalf of us. Everlasting Father means he is the father or the author and original of eternal life. Before him, eternal life did not exist. By reason of his finished work, he became the father of eternity. 
He gave birth to that state known as eternal life, meaning once fallen men and women are now able to enter the presence of God and experience the life and glory of God. This is why a son was given, that by reason of his person and work, eternal life would be located in him, and he gives it to whomsoever he wills. We really need to pay attention. I, well, you know, I'll tell you what, those who are members of the class, they already know this stuff. You can appreciate what was being said. First John 5, 11. This is the record that God has given to us eternal life, and this life is in his son. God has given to us eternal life, and this life is in his son. But wait a minute. What's, the, what's behind giving? You know, John 17, 2, John, same John, as thou has given him power. You see, the, the, the son is praying to the father. As thou has given him power over all flesh, the father, the son has power over all all flesh, which means everybody without exception on the face of the earth, every single human being, the Lord Jesus Christ has power over all flesh. And it is up to him that he should give eternal life to as many as thou hast given him. So in other words, Jesus isn't waiting for someone to make a decision. He is, the, he is, the, he is working this way. Did the Father give these to me? Did the Father give that one to me? Did the Father give that one to me? Then at the appointed time, I am going to give eternal life to them. So you see, please remember, it is by grace that we receive this life. Before Christ, grace did not exist. Forgiveness did not exist. You say, well, forgiveness did not exist? No, just ask the angels who sinned. Christ originated eternal life, and he chooses who will participate in it. Everything he did, he did with us in mind. Let's take a look. Let's take a look. Uh, bear with me. I'm going to turn to Ephesians chapter 1. I'm going to read out of my, my, my uh, King Jesus version, uh, Ephesians chapter 1. And I'm going to read from verse 3. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who had done, this is a story of us, who had blessed us with all spiritual blessings in heavenly places in Christ, according as he has chosen us in him before the foundation of the world. You see where eternal life is? In Christ. Okay? In him before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and without blame before him in love having predestinated us unto the adoption of children by Jesus Christ to himself, according to the good pleasure of his will, to the praise of the glory of his grace, wherein he had made us acceptable in the beloved. You see, when Christ went to the cross, he went to the cross with, with a, a, a group of people called us on his mind. You see, to the praise of the glory of his grace, wherein he had made us, us accepted in the beloved, in whom we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sins according to the riches of his grace, wherein he hath abounded toward us in all wisdom and prudence, having made known unto us the mystery of his will according to his good pleasure, which he had purposed in himself, that in the dispensation of the fullness of times, he might gather together in one all things in Christ, both which are in heaven and which are in earth, even in him, in whom also we have obtained an inheritance, being predestinated according to the purpose of him who worketh all things after the counsel of his own will, that we should be to the praise of his glory, who first trusted in Christ, in whom also you trusted after you heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, in whom after that you believed, you were sealed with that Holy Spirit of promise. Us. It is just a story of us. Matthew chapter 6. Let's take a look at Matthew chapter 6, verses 9 to 13. Jesus is telling them, because he understands the concept of us. He says, after this manner pray ye, our Father, in other words, the Father of us, 
which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done in earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us. Or listen to me. The whole thing about the fatherhood of God and the brotherhood of man, no one else can pray this prayer but us. It is a prayer that is authorized by the Lord Jesus Christ to be prayed by us and us only. Forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Look at Hebrews chapter four. Let's take a look. Let's take a look. The, the writer to Hebrews is saying, let us therefore fear, lest the promise being left us. Who, who, who was the promise directed to? Is it directed to the world? No, us, a promise being left us of entering into his rest any of you should seem to come short of it. For unto us was the gospel preached. Wait a minute. I mean, okay. As well as unto them. Notice now there's a, there's a dichotomy. There is us versus them. Who is us? Us are the ones that God has a redemptive covenant, a redemptive uh, uh, love and salvation directed towards. But the them are those who did not receive the gift of faith and repentance so that that which they heard couldn't profit them because it was not mixed with faith in them that heard it. You, you follow that? So, so we could go on and on, but I hope you get the point. Redemption is a story about us. And we are not able to understand the Peter passage without an understanding of the concept of us. Now let's take a closer look at the Peter passage. Let's take a closer look. The Lord is not slack concerning his promise as some men count slackness, but is long suffering to what? To us, what? Not willing that any should perish and that all should come to repentance. You see, the thing is this, the focus is us. And after the comma, you keep reading and your mind strays you will lose the sense of what the Holy Spirit is trying to say. The whole verse is dealing with us. You see, this passage seems to be saying, that I'm going, I'm going to show you. The passage seems to be saying that God wants to save everyone. But there are many other scriptures which clearly teach otherwise. Will scripture contradict scripture? Hmm? As a teacher, I tell you, if you find one contradicting in scripture, the entire Bible falls apart. See? First clue. Here's the first clue. Peter informs us that God is long-suffering to us, word. That's the first clue. Who are the beneficiaries of God's long-suffering? Whom is he long-suffering towards? Is it the world or is it us? Remember that redemption is a story about us. Look closely and you will see that he is long-suffering towards us. But what does Peter mean when he says that the Lord is not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance? The only way to interpret this passage is to read it within the context of the story of us. Let me explain. But first, let's take note that the Holy Spirit has given us a key by which to unlock this passage. And the key is to see things within the context of the days of Noah. Otherwise, you're going to miss it. In the days of Noah, God had determined he was going to destroy the earth with a flood. All flesh was going to die. But he told Noah to prepare an ark to the saving of his house. Hold that thought. Now we go to Sodom and Gomorrah. God warned Lot that he was about to overthrow God warned Lot that he was about to overthrow the cities of Sodom and Gomorrah, turning them to ashes. Please note the consistent theme. Please note. First, God is getting ready to bring about complete destruction upon the earth or upon a city. 
That's, that's the theme, it's a template by which we use to unlock the meaning of, of, of 2 Peter 3, 9. But he has loved ones within the path of the storm, within the path of destruction. In the case of Noah, as angry as God was, and as ready as he was to destroy the earth, the whole earth and all flesh on it, he had to restrain his wrath for a time. Why? In Noah's day, he held back his vengeance for at least 120 years. Why? Because Noah was still building the ark. And if God had executed judgment on the earth before Noah was finished, Noah and his family would have perished and God was not willing that any of Noah's family should perish so he was long suffering towards Noah but the day Noah entered the ark wow I mean the day he entered the ark in the 600 year of Noah's life in the second month the 17th day of the month the same day the, the God wasted that's to tell you how he was just waiting the same day were all the fountains of the great deep broken up and the windows of heaven were opened. Look, 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 look at this. Look, look at verse 13. Look at verse 13. Yeah. Verse 13 said, in the self same day entered Noah and Shem, Ham and Japheth, the sons of Noah and Noah's wife and the three wives of his sons with them into the ark. In other words, as soon as God saw that Noah was safe, he shut the doors and rained judgment down upon the earth. God held back because his long suffering was directed toward Noah. Note the same pattern with Lot. Only after God was sure that Lot and his family were out of danger did he rain fire and brimstone down on Sodom and Gomorrah. We can read of this in Genesis 19. But the lesson here is this. This is the lesson. The Lord knows how to deliver the godly out of temptation and to reserve the unjust unto the day of judgment to be punished. Just as there was scoffers in those days when the ark was still being prepared, just so are there scoffers in our day openly questioning the promise of his coming. But Peter refers back to Noah. He reminds them of the destruction of the world that then was. And he mixes together the, the days of Noah when the heavens were opened, bringing a worldwide flood, and the days of Lot where the heavens rained down fire. He reminds them that the heavens and the earth that are now are, being, are likewise being kept in store, waiting for judgment to be poured out. But just as God in his long suffering waited until the last person entered the ark, just as he waited until Lot was safely out of Sodom, just so is God being long suffering now. God is waiting on two things. Revelation 6, 11. In verse 10, they were asking God, how long before you, you, you pass judgment on these criminals on the earth who have, you know, I mean, how long, Lord? You know? Um, and white robes were given unto every one of them, and it was said unto them that they should rest yet for a little season. Look at this. Until their fellow servants also and their brethren that should be killed as they were should be fulfilled. In other words, when the last Christian who is destined to be murdered is murdered, God is going to come and rain fire down upon this earth. Two things. The second thing God is waiting on, which is going to happen at the same time, for the last person predestined to believe, to enter the ark of Christ. Because God knows that if he acts prematurely and returns in judgment too soon, his loved ones are going to perish in the day of judgment and perdition of ungodly men and God is not willing that any should perish. Do you see the context? Meaning any of us. But that all are predestined to receive the gift of repentance. All that are predestined to receive the gifts of repentance 
should come to repentance. Hmm? See that? I'm going to try to find Second Peter 3. Here it is. Second Peter. The Lord, read this again in the light of what we just said. The Lord is not slack concerning his promise as some men count slackness, but is long-suffering to us, word. Not willing that any what? Any what? You take that to mean any person in the world, you have lost the context. The context is us. He is not willing that any of us. Because there are people who are, who are supposed to be born again, who are still not born again as yet. And if God rain judgment now, now upon the earth, they are going to perish. But God is not willing that any of us should perish, but that all should come to repentance. In other words, everyone that God has determined he will give the, the gift of faith and repentance to, he is waiting on the, on the proper time. Because there is always the proper time, the appointed time. And when that comes in, we don't know who is the very last person who is supposed to, from the foundation of the world that God says, you are the last person who will be born again. And when that happens, run for cover if you're not a, a, a child of God. Just simply run for cover. <laughs> There's nowhere to run, by the way. You see, the, 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 in other words, God is waiting for the last person who is meant to repent and believe to repent and believe. Let, let's, let's take a look. Let's take a look. Let me find my place again. Yeah. Acts 17, 31. Because he has appointed a day. See this here? Be very careful, you know, like we said last, last Wednesday, don't think that God has to wait till everybody hears the gospel. That means he'll never return. Because at least a million people are being born every day. So he'll have to keep postponing it until they can hear it. And while he's waiting on them, a million more being born every day. So he'll never return. So it's a trick. Don't fall for that. God has appointed a day in which he will judge the world in righteousness by that man whom he had ordained, whereof he has given assurance unto all men in that he had raised him from the dead. So seeing that God has appointed a day in which to return, it means that judgment day will also be the day the last person meant to come to, come to Christ will come to Christ, the self-same day. The self same day. So those spiritually blind and dead people who have drawn a wrong conclusion that God is slack concerning his promise to return, do not understand that the delay is about us, not about them. God has been merciful and long-suffering to us, not willing that any of us should perish, but that all of us should come to repentance. Again, the word us here cannot mean the whole world. Because no one just comes to repentance. It is a gift from God to those who belong to the Father from the foundation of the world. Acts 11. When they heard these things, they held their peace and glorified God, saying, Okay, then God hath also given to the Gentiles, and also to the Gentiles, granted repentance unto life. Okay. You have repentance, you have repentance unto life. One is a worldly repentance, one is a gift from God. Let's turn quickly to another passage and wrap this up. Let's turn to another passage. First Timothy 2 4. Who will have all men to be saved and to come unto the knowledge of the truth? Now, you see, this last passage really belongs to the teaching entitled, Does All Always Mean All? Again, we come upon the question of all without exception versus all without distinction. I did what I said I would do, and I looked at this from an English language perspective, even checking with an ordinary dictionary. That doesn't always help. And again, it was of no help. Okay. 
I have to refer back to the biblical context and refer to such passages as John 12, 32. If I be lifted up from the earth, I will draw all. And again, what does the word all mean? Does it mean all without exception? Well, if so, Jesus Christ is prophecy failed. But if it is all without distinction, meaning all types, I will draw all types of men unto me, you know, whether uh, Jew or Gentile, I will draw, then that prophecy has been fulfilled and is being fulfilled as we speak. But keeping that passage in mind, it cannot mean all men without exception, because that would refer to everyone in the world. There are people who insist that 1 Timothy 2.4 means all men without exception. And when I dug deeper into why they would make such an insistence, I realized that they believed in universalism, meaning everybody is going to be saved eventually. Here in Timothy, we need to remind ourselves that ultimately, God's will is going to be done in heaven and earth. So if God will have all men to be saved and the scripture cannot be broken, this cannot mean all men without exception. It has to mean all men without distinction. It has to mean all kinds of men. Want some proof? Let's look at verse 1. I exhort therefore that first of all supplications, prayers, intercessions, and giving of thanks be made for all men. Okay? Now, the apostle here has in mind all kinds of men, all men without distinction or prejudice, you know, as to race or class or gender. And he goes on to show when he identifies what he means by all men. See, that scripture interprets scripture. In verse 1, when he speaks about, you know, supplications, prayers, intercessions, and giving of thanks be made for all men. Now let's go to verse 2 for the explanation. For kings, whoa, well, he, he's actually telling us what he means by all men. Not, I mean, even kings and all that are in authority, whether it's the president, the mayor, the governor, that we may lead a quiet and and the prime minister, the emperor, that we may lead a quiet and peaceable life in all godliness and honesty. Huh? Godliness and honesty. In the, in the Timothy passage, the Timothy passage, Paul cannot be saying that God wants to save everybody in the world. He means all men without distinction, not exception, even kings. But look at this. You could have missed this. Not the very subtle declaration that Caesar is not Lord and God. Because in those days, you had to take a pinch of incense, throw it in the fire, and utter, Caesar is Lord. Because Caesar considered himself to be a God. But here's what Paul is saying. Paul is saying, Caesar is no God. And he said it without saying it. What did he say? Pray for him. See, in the, subtle, very subtle. You see? Because if Caesar needs to be prayed for, he cannot be God. Well, praise the Lord. This brings us to the end of tonight's lecture. I trust you were edified. God bless. Love you all.